All right, we're gonna move right along to uh, Julian K. Jarbo, who's talking about procedural sound design. Procedural sound design for roguelikes. Hello, my name is Julian K. Jarbo, and I'm a writer and sound designer and artist. Sometimes, especially with personal projects, I'm all three at the same time. I wouldn't recommend overextending yourself creatively like this, even and perhaps especially with unpaid passion projects. But I suppose if none of us had ever done that, none of us would be here at a roguelike celebration. I say this up front because the topic of my lightning talk, procedural sound design for roguelikes, might sound overly broad or obtusely technical. And I don't want to disappoint you if you're here for something that it's not. So for clarity, I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes focused on two inseparable aspects of what matters most to me about this topic in conversation with this specific community. One, you should be thoughtfully incorporating sound design into your games if you are not already. If you think sound, including its absence, is not an important or meaningful part of your game, I am sorry to tell you this, but you're mistaken. Two, you can do this even if you have a tin ear, an empty wallet, and a New Year's resolution to rein in the scope creep of your projects. Musical talent, fancy software, and infinite free time are certainly helpful, but you already have the most essential qualities for good sound design. You understand that even simple, common, and fairly abstract symbols can convey an enormous amount of information. Furthermore, you're probably curious and like to tinker. Maybe you want to perpetually nudge a bit outside your comfort zone. If so, congrats. So, how do we achieve these things? Well, here are Julian's rules and tools for achieving some sound design in your roguelike as directed. First concept. You must be honest and kind with yourself about your own sensory quirks. They are assets, not limitations, and are part of your style and voice. For example, there's no such thing as just putting on headphones. Here are 10 different reasons someone might wear them. One, to quiet the noise of the outside world around them. Two, to quiet the noise of the inside world in their mind. Three, to relax or fall asleep. Four, to wake up or exercise. Five, to achieve a particular mood or attitude. Six, to focus and work productively. Seven, to feel focused and productive while doing nothing. Eight, as an inward substitute for companionship. Nine, as an inward substitute for personal space. 10, as an outward barrier to assert personal space, sometimes not even listening to anything at all. Some people are always going to turn a game's sound off and listen to their own selections, and that's okay. But understand the different reasons people do listen, and try to make your game something at least you would want to listen to. Five thoughts about process. It needs to feel accurate, not be accurate. Classically, if you want a punch to sound like a punch, you're better off snapping celery in front of a microphone than recording a boxing match. Two, procedural sound generation can mean a lot of things. Writing software to compose a sonata is no more or less legitimate than recording your own burps into your phone, putting the burp files in one folder, and then closing your eyes and pointing at the screen to pick one. Some people will disagree with me about this, and they're welcome to write their own presentation. Three, collaging and mixing together pre-existing sound files that you have the right to use until you make them your own is a legitimate way to design. Four, using something given away freely for you to use for free is not cheating. Five, collaborating with others, including hiring someone else in a purely transactional exchange is also not cheating. You don't have to do it all yourself. Second concept. There is more to sound design than just music and sound effects, and you don't necessarily need to incorporate either or both of them. Atmospheric sound, for example, often defies both categories. It can be quite simple, subtle, and powerful. But more so, the sounds of the player's environment while they are playing, 
including the sounds they make themselves, are ultimately part of their experience of the design. Even if this seems like hypothetical woo-woo as an exercise, it does matter. What expectations and conditions is your game made for? We already think about this a lot with more established conversation around accessibility and numpads. Same deal, but for ears. Imagine playing and listening to your game on a small ThinkPad with a set of CVS earbuds and no mouse, and you're on a cramped commuter train. Now consider it again with a 4K monitor, some OK headphones, decent mechanical keyboard, decent Staples office chair, private rented bedroom late at night. Now consider this again on a surround sound home entertainment system with a massive projection screen and a leather recliner. These are really different. Five thoughts about technique. One, audio sprites exist exactly the way visual sprites do. You can economically bundle and reuse a fairly small library of sounds and modify effects on the fly. Two, mix in the best set of external speakers or over-ear headphones that you can afford or reasonably borrow. Three, pursue a basic grasp of frequency bands. You don't need to be able to run a fancy mixer at a live rock show. You will want to know what noisy and muddy means when it comes to a lot of different overlapping audio, and to know that you can fix that problem without deleting sounds. Four, understand why MIDI has persisted as a technology. It's great if you deeply understand how it works, but bare minimum, try to understand why it's valuable. Five, you can't always control for consistent quality. Luckily, I think it matters less in the overall design than consistent volume, which you can control. Third concept, whether you call it your game's market or genre or tone or vibe or big mood, it is a promise that you as a designer are making to your players and listeners too. Here's part of a very adaptable worksheet I originally wrote for fiction podcast writers. What does your setting sound like? Write down whatever sonic associations you have with the ideas about this setting. There are no wrong answers. Review your list of sounds and consider what it is that makes them feel like that genre. Imagine that tomorrow morning our real world sounded like all of, but only, the things on your list. Are there specific types of music, machines, animals, weather, and people that are present? Why? Are there specific types of music, machines, animal, weather, and people that are absent? Why? Couldn't actually... Oh, well, there we go. Super quick. Anything oh. you want to say with one minute, Julian? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the most important thing is that um, all of the things that I said exist in a Google Doc um, that I want you all to see uh, because I'm going to link it. Um, and uh, so if you were like, wait, I want to read that, guess what? It's all written down. And then at the very bottom of the Google Doc is a bunch of links to cool stuff that I use all the time for sound design. So um, that's it. That was the thing I wanted to show live. Amazing. Thank you. And um, maybe tweet that out, do something like that. Tag Roguelike Celebration, we'll try and get that in front of people.